You are now listening to Feeding Off Each Other. Welcome back to another episode of Feeding Off Each Other. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, Kaz. Hello, Jason. Hello. hello. And hello, Phil. Hello. Um, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to look here. <laughs> at all at of us. us at I guess. Once. Yeah, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to look up if you guys don't mind. <laughs> Happy Wismas. Yeah, this is uh, the first Wismas I've done in uh, since 2019, so good to be back. Yeah. And it was a total surprise to see you here. Yeah, I, I, I don't usually tell people what, when I'm going to be someplace. I prefer just to be uh, more of a like, more of a surprise. It was I a was surprise. Yeah. It was, I was there. I was sitting next to you, and I didn't realize you were there. <laughs> no, no he, like I, I was like, he still hasn't registered. Yeah, no, I was I was totally tuned in too. I was like, when's the moment? And then he, and then you say hi, and then Kaz just doesn't react, and he goes for your glasses on top of your head. Like, that's not say how you say hi, Kaz. Well, I was like. I think it's Phil. He wait, must wait, have, wait. had the GT hat. Oh, for, it's the GT hat. For the viewer hat. at home, what happened? Because we were... Oh, we were so at, we... You guys are at Longhorn. Mm-hmm. You guys are already there, seated, having a beer. I came in, sat down, said hi to... I said hi to Van Can, his girlfriend. I said hi to Jason and Matt. And then Phil was like, hey. And I go, Just oh, didn't hey. say hi to the other guy at the table. I yeah. said, I said <laughs> hi. Just disregarded. <laughs> but I didn't clue in. It was Phil. He was starstruck. I, uh... <laughs> I shaved my uh, my mustache off. Ah, you don't mm. have the uh, iconic the handlebar. Bar. I mean, it's still there. It's just filled in. <laughs> yeah, it's filled in. If I put my finger up and block your goatee area, then yeah. It's still there, yeah. So uh, normally every podcast we've done an intro. We've like mm. pre-written an intro. We don't have an intro written for you. But I mean, we could just free ball it, you know. Yeah, Kaz, you why, do do you, uh, okay. why do you, you want, uh, do you feel <laughs> <All right>. confident? <laughs> Today's guest on this podcast He's an ex downhill racer, now YouTuber. He has over five hundred thousand subscribers. Five hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. A cat. He's got a great mustache. Uh, he's a GT sponsored rider. Uh, he's uh, known for his uh, tutorials and teaching of skills. Thus, his name. <laughs> Skills with Phil, everybody. Give him a round of applause. Welcome. That, uh, for being on the fly, that was pretty good. Yeah, so we actually ask our guests to rate the intro after. So out of 10, what do you think about that intro? Um, a solid seven. Okay, thank you. What would you have added? I don't know. Any like crucial bits that define your character and who you are? Off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but... Um, Okay, I guess I have to upgrade it then. We, like, we, we nailed it then. Yeah, yeah. you guys definitely I'll got take it. Yeah, that's a 10 out of 10. Wait, so how do you go from 7 to 10? <laughs> I, I realized the error of my uh, my, my curve. <laughs> I was being too harsh. Well, how's your Wismas weekend been so far? Well, got one day of riding in, so an A-line was open, so can't complain. Oh, you rode A-line? Yeah, they opened it at the end. For an hour and a half. Yeah. Oh, really? You didn't get the memo. Uh, no, we j- Jace, or Kaz and I were filming on Crank It Up. Ah. Why did they open it for an hour and a half? I think the, the I don't know if this is official, but they wanted to see how much damage would be done in an hour and a half oh, to okay. gauge <laughs> if they should open it for the next day. Because it's been super wet here in Whistler. It snowed the day before opening day. And A-Line obviously got freshly rebuilt. It's all very soft. But I feel like it's good to go. I we wrote it. It's good to go. Would you agree? Definitely. Yeah. Have you ever ridden a line in such <clears throat> good conditions? No, there is not a single braking bump on deterrence. So you've been riding for the day. You haven't. You rode a few a line laps. Yep. What did you ride other than a line? Because that's what we were kind of. We were like, "What are you going to ride?" And they're like, "I have. I don't know. I don't know." What else? I think he strikes me as like easy does it guy. Yeah, a lot of easy does it, and uh, that's about it. Yeah, yeah. Did a fire road climb a few times and <laughs> nice. You don't you don't even take the chairlift. You just Not, climb up. Yeah, I, I brought my e bike. <laughs> mm, good call. Um, no, we did a lot of uh, I guess blues, technical blues. So like Ninja Cougar, that stuff. Um, and then ended up on Slayer quite a bit. By that I mean twice. Slayer's great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Part- running so good. Partially because I dropped my goggles. Oh, <laughs> off the chairlift? <laughs> yeah. Oh no way. <laughs> I don't think I've ever dropped anything off chairlift. It was ever. My, it was my first experience. No way. Yeah. 
Have you guys noticed the amount of seasons passes and debit cards below the chairlift? Yeah, no, and never. a phone. Oh, gloves, gloves. Well, oh, gloves from the winter, but there's so many seasons passes, so many driver's licenses, debit cards just under the chairlift. I just say like mitts and poles, and I don't have any use for that. Like ski poles. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. I should get a metal detector though and do the whole line up. <laughs> there's like 24 lifts in Whistler. Man, I could probably make like 10 bucks. <laughs> or have my own seasons pass. It doesn't do me any good. <laughs> Dead air. So Dead air. you dropped your uh, goggles. What was your reaction? Um, oh, shit. I, like, I felt like a noob. I, I'm, I'm always concerned that if I do drop my phone or something, I'm going to panic and then fall off the chairlift after. Yeah, I, actually, that's a good question. So like I, I was playing with my GoPro, which YouTubers <laughs> like to do. And <laughs> Risky business. I hadn't like secured them, and I felt something fall. So my immediate reaction was like to stick out my foot. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have yeah. that. I have that too. Where like, you tried to like minimize the damage of whatever. Yeah. So I kicked <laughs> okay. out my foot and I felt it bounce off mine and then go towards like the people sitting to my right who also did the same thing. So we almost caught them, but they fell through the cracks. Oh man, it would have been epic if you just kicked it back. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm not that cool. And then just posted an Instagram immediately after that. <laughs> so wait, are they gone forever? Or did you go get we them? Got, we got them. Oh nice. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mission accomplished. Played this yeah. cheering sound effect. Sorry, we're 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 easing into the sound effects. Kaz is our DJ. Our, he's not normally the uh, DJ slash producer, so bear with us. How, how many sound effects do we have? We have eight sound effects, and I think we'll only use seven. No, 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 no. See, Kaz, ugh, sorry, trainee moment. Kaz, if you go into the menu, you can go to a second <coughs> alternate menu of the soundboard, and you will get a total of 16 sounds. No, that's not. Oh, so I flipped the label around, and that's... No, 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 no. That's not how it works. It's fine. We'll teach you after. We only have 45 minutes with Phil because he's got to go to the uh, sushi village to have the classic Ooh. like industry dirt bag party, drinking sake margaritas. And so like everyone has to go through this. Yes. Okay. That's I, I thought it was special. It is special. Yeah, yeah you are special. Yeah, no, it is good. Yeah, you're absolutely special. Okay. It, should I be worried? Mm, do you like sake? <laughs> I don't drink it that often. Do you, do you like, like margaritas? Do you like yeah, strawberry? I don't drink it that often. Do you like strawberry flavor? Sure. Oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be jumping off the rooftops. Yeah. Do you like raw fish as well? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's like a, just a classic thing. I feel like uh, growing up in the industry, it was a cool thing to go to industry parties. And I don't know, there's always like a big bill. And it was like my... I mean, when I was like 19 and I saw like a $600 bill to table, I was like, what the hell? How do they spend so much money? And now I'm like, oh, that's only like five people at Sushi Village. It's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. I, I got to imagine your perception of mountain biking is quite different than mine, having grown up in like the epicenter for, or like basically basically ground zero for like the culture. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. We're privileged for sure. Yeah, we're like <laughs> very we're, privileged. We're looking outside from the inside. I mean, I, I mean, not to toot your own horns, but like I feel like you guys kind of set the tone for Whistler mountain biking quite a bit. Hopefully that's a good thing. I, yeah, actually, I was in, uh, we were uh, out, out and about doing interviews today. Obviously, we interviewed you. And uh, people were like, well, what are you making? Because we were just asking them stupid questions. And I was like, well, we're making like a, a Wismas video or like a video for opening day. And they're like, oh, yeah, you guys like, you started that. <laughs> and I was like, did we? I don't even know. Like, I get, like, we said it in a video in 2017, I think. Wismas? Yeah, Wismas. No, I yeah. don't think we did. I think it was, I, I I think it was BCPOV, and I think he yeah. was saying we started doing Whistler openings. Yeah. And we, like, popularized I think, it? I think he meant we popularized I, it. We, like, brought it to the forefront. I would agree with that. BCPOV is, like, clenching his fist right now watching. <laughs> Listening. Normal watching, who knows? Uh, maybe we can go to uh, Google Trends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, maybe. That's maybe. a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Jamie, pull that up. Sorry, Kaz, pull that up. <laughs> okay, it might take more than 45 minutes. No, 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 don't, <laughs> don't touch the computer. <laughs> so is it worth uh, taking a flight all the way across the country to ride Whistler? Absolutely. Right on. I mean, our trails aren't really open yet, so... Yeah. I mean, they're just getting going. So for that reason alone, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's good <clears throat> because uh, I I've, haven't spent any time out east... And I'd love to hit some of the bike parts out there. I mean, our goal is this summer we're going to do a I Only Ride Park tour. And the goal is to hopefully take it abroad and uh, do like a U.S. tour and come out to 
Highland, which I'm guessing is near you ish. It's not too far. Like the, the East coast, everything is super concentrated. So like, yeah. um, there's like five different resorts that you can hit like on East coast. Like some of them are better than others. Uh, but Highland is like the most equivalent. I like say that with a grain of salt, like to Whistler. Cause it's like the one of the few bike parks that has like a really heavy mountain bike culture. Mm, okay. um, and th- there's other places that have bike parks, but it, they're not the same. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's going to be very different for you guys. Like, I guess I'm glad I live on the East coast. So anytime I go other places, everything else seems awesome. Like, I, I mean, like, I <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't get good. me wrong. Like yeah. there's a reason why I live there. I, I like, I love it. It's really awkward technical riding. Um, but for what I do on video stuff, some of it doesn't like show up that well, especially like for some reason, like a lot of like the fo- foliage, like just is always like brown and just like, you guys have like dark soil with like, greens and like big trees and it looks good. And then right, you know, we have like really awkward saplings and stuff. And so like for what I do, it doesn't look great, but I like the riding. Yeah, we do gotcha. have that, that that bonus of it. It looks beautiful here, too. <clears throat> and it helps us as photographers and videographers capture the sport, too. Yeah. yeah. Like, unless we have, like, a bunch of ferns, it doesn't look that good. Right. Oh, you guys have some ferns out there. Yeah, we, we have our own uh, fernie. When is that? <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when's, like, the prime time to get greenery? Like Coming up soon. Like, okay, uh, yeah. early June, late May. Okay, so a little bit later than what it would be for us. Like, shooting a Squamish, it's, like, the perfect time. I would say it's, like... A month ago. Yeah. Like yeah, April. I'd, I'd say that. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, even Vermont, like, well, I grew up in Southern New Hampshire. I moved around a lot, but that's where I spent the most amount of time where I am in Vermont now, which is only like two hours away from where I grew up. The like difference in riding seasons is like two months. Mm. Um, just cause like that part of Vermont, like everything just takes so long to melt and whatnot. So, uh, you know, like people are riding like in March in New Hampshire, but not so much in Vermont. Hmm. I feel like you guys have like crazy fall colors. Yeah. Out, like insane. People go to Vermont for fall. Yeah. Look at the trees. Um, <laughs> the reason behind that is like, it's all the sugar maples and maples. And so Vermont's known for maple syrup. I guess Canada too. Oh, yeah, whoa, 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 As a Canadian, whoa, whoa, whoa. I support this message. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, we'll, we'll trade maple syrups and see. Um, <laughs> but the, the reason why is because like that, like there's a band of like sugar maples um, and that's the, the tree that produces the sap that you use for maple uh, syrup. And it's really concentrated in Vermont going up into Quebec. Mm, okay. Um, I didn't actually know that. <laughs> and those are the, like some of the trees that like turn the brightest colors between those and like red uh, maples and whatnot. Interesting. But yeah, it's like, um, I went to, my wife and I, we went to school down in North Carolina, which also has pretty nice falls. Um, and people from Florida go there to see the like, or we call it leaf peeping season. Excuse me? Leaf peeping. <laughs> <laughs> leaf peeping. I think you get arrested for that in Whistler. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and people who come to see it are leaf peepers. No way. <laughs> I, I honestly would love to come peep some leaves myself because we, I mean, the furthest east I've, east I've gone is Quebec City, I suppose. I mean, you'd get good leaves there. Yeah, fall in yeah. Quebec. Is well, I, well, actually, no, I've, I've been more eastern than that with you in New York on our uh, gravel bike yeah, I like f- uh, video shoot. That that region gets some pretty sweet uh, falls too, so, mm. man, that, that was a trip. That was a great trip. So actually, Kaz and I were both on that trip. Jason uh, wasn't there at the time, but mm-hmm. we had uh, Andrew Santos with us. And yeah, we were filming you on a gravel bike, which is a bit unusual. Yeah, that that and I was uh, riding through the streets of New York yeah. on a gravel bike. Oh, that mm. was so much fun. And scary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd rather go down Schleyer on, uh, without brakes and do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, on that shoot, we had the whole concept was that you meet different people along the way on your bike who all your, all these other people are on bikes, but they're different types of bikers. And two of those bikers were guys on fixies who recreationally just weave through traffic in New York city and uh, I mean, you may have seen this stuff like in your Instagram reels, but mm-hmm. yeah, they get dicey with cars. They like, they get really up and close with like trucks that could easily squish you. Like the pinches, like you get to like when like two cars are like 
side by side each other and they just like go through is like insane. I I don't know how they do it. Well, you were following them. You went for it. I I mean, I was just, just like, if I pulled back, I would die. So I had to like stay on his wheel to survive. Like <laughs> I'm I'm just using his his judgment as my like whatever he does, I do. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's like the same as training someone on Schleyer. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, well, this could go terribly wrong, but I mean, I guess he knows what he's doing in front. I would, I mean, he was still alive, so I'd hope so. Yeah. I think they grew up there, I guess, but yeah, it was really cool to actually get to do that. What What's the name of that video? The Great Escape. Right. Mm. Great Escape with Skills, skills with Phil. So speaking of Skills with Phil, uh, you're, you've been on a long YouTube journey for those who don't know. Uh, tell us about your YouTube and your YouTube channel and your journey thus far. Yeah, so I <clears throat> before YouTube, I started out as a downhill racer, um, and I like through my career, I had like a lot of like you know ups and downs, and um, I I was never good enough to rely just on my race results. Um, at the same time, I always found it really hard to get sponsorship. Um, and I wasn't really much into social media at the time, um, but I, like, I spent a lot of time on YouTube watching videos, and at some point, I wanted to make a sick edit. Um, <laughs> and uh, like, I was like heavily inspired by like, Chris A. Craig and like, some of the like, videos he would put out, but like, I, I wanted to like, make a video, and I didn't know how to make a video. I didn't know how to use a camera, because we didn't have iPhones in our pockets at the time. Mm. Like, so no one like, just knew how to use a camera. Like you actually had to look up, Hey, what settings should I set my camera to? Um, how do I do slow-mo? Cause most cameras didn't come with like 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time on YouTube watching tutorials about how to use cameras. Um, and in that process, like I actually like discovered that a lot of these communities, like these filmmaking communities <coughs> had, um, like, just people commenting on one video would be on someone else's channel. So I, I was like paying attention. It's like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like people really like interacting with other YouTube channels. And there's something here. I like that. I never paid attention to because at the time, this is when I started doing research, it was probably like 2010 ish, something around there. Um, what, what, what was that? When you started doing it was probably like 2010 or what was that? You oh, the, the time frame for like when I started like kind of like paying attention to this uh, was happening in 2010. Okay. Um, and so like going through the process of like learning how to like do, I'd watch a lot of tutorials and then like I realized, wait, there aren't many people doing tutorials for mountain biking. And like, even though I was like a professional downhill racer, I was never a coach. I never knew how to, uh, like the proper ways to teach on how to do a skill. But I did know when I would watch a tutorial that I felt left out a lot of information as a viewer, I would get frustrated because I'd seen that and like, you know, how to fix your computer and they leave out like a crucial step. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like I would watch uh, some of the other mountain bike tutorials because like there were channels making that had tutorials, but they're embedding them on other websites. So they weren't making videos for YouTube. There wasn't that like community like commenting like the like it was just like a graveyard of comments. Um so I kind of picked up that like there was no like nobody making content for YouTube specifically as a mountain bike channel. Um I think Jordan may have been posting GoPro videos at the time, but like there was no like uh tutorials or whatnot. Mm, for the audience, Jordan Boostmaster. Yes. Yes. He I think he was an OG uh, at the, like a trendsetter at the time. I think sure, he was yeah. our first mountain bike vlog. I, it's so tough to whatever say. You like, want we to we were making some mountain bike vlogs in like what 20, 20, 21, 11 or. But were you posting them on YouTube or pink we bike? Were on, on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, there's some stuff that we pulled up recently that we're like, oh my God, I completely forgot that we were doing that. Like we were doing it before we even knew we were doing it. Was it was probably 2010. We were okay. doing it. Like, okay. but. Not in the same way where we're like, we're going to make a mountain bike vlog channel. You know, it was yeah. just like, we're just going to go out and ride. It was more just documenting camera. our life. Yeah. I think at the time, like there was like, you could have a channel, a mountain bike channel, and someone else could have a mountain bike channel, but the audiences didn't know about each other. Mm -hmm. For sure. So like there was no crossover community. Um, so I, I realized in the process of like doing all this research about cameras, like watching tutorials, hey, there's a like a niche 
that needs to be filled for mountain bike uh, videos specifically made for YouTube where the person making the video actually responds to the commenters and actually like interacts. It's not just like a graveyard. Like you're not talking to a wall. Um, so I spent a lot of time like making my first tutorial and like um, a little backstory. At the time I had stopped racing professionally and I had actually just started going back to school. So like when I posted my for, uh, first tutorial, I had done my freshman year of, it was in my freshman year of college. Oddly enough, I started racing again because collegiate racing is a thing. And I got uh, first in national championships for collegiate cycling. So that got me excited to race again. But then I also posted my first tutorial and that got a lot of people excited. And I like I saw something there. I was like, wow, I just gained 3,000 subscribers from one video, which was a lot. And what was that That's video? Uh, how to manual. Okay. Oh, okay. And I should say I had posted some other videos before that, but that was the first video I did at Skills with Phil. A lot of people want to learn how to wheelie. We have a very popular wheelie video on our channel too. <laughs> people just want to get their wheels off the ground. There like, you go, yeah. They don't, they don't care about like the actual things that are important. They just want to know how to get front wheel off the ground and both wheels off the ground. Well, I can't, I still can't really wheelie. So I'll get a tutorial uh, private lesson maybe with you one day. I'm okay. Like there are better people <laughs> at manualing than me. Oh, I thought you'd be like, I'm okay. I won't give you a tutorial. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so you got 3,000 subscribers, and you kind of were pulled in two directions. Three, because oh. I, I was going for, to school for business and marketing. Right. I was going to, like, my mountain bike racing career was taking off, because that was the year that I did World Cups. And I ended up qualifying 23rd at Wyndham, um, which, like, was huge, because I was the second fastest American that day. Wow. Um, Who was first? Gwen. Oh, big surprise. Mm -hmm. Have you seen his house? <laughs> the one he sold? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. That's what you get for first place, man. I don't know. If not first or last. <laughs> Dang. Um, so you just, uh, you looked at Gwyn's time and you're like, well, I guess it's YouTube for me. I, I mean, I knew like there was like, even on my best run, like the g top guys would always be 10 seconds faster. Like it does like, so I, I knew in like back of my head, I, I can like that, like race results solidified, like, Hey, I can hang with these guys, but I knew I didn't have the drive or like perseverance to like do the training necessary to get to that next level. And frankly, it didn't sound like fun. Um, what were you struggling with at the time? I never trained. Like I couldn't like to like be at that level. You just have to dedicate so much work. And I, I, I think the other thing is like, it's a mental battle. And for me, like I always found racing to be super nerve wracking and I just didn't necessarily like the environment. Um, like I, I feel like I like it when you're doing well, but when you're not doing well, you hate it. Mm. But I also felt like I was always an outcast, even in a racing scene. Um, and so I was always like, felt like, I kind of identified more with like internet culture and that kind of stuff more than I did with racing culture, but I was good at racing. So I did it. Yeah. Well, if you didn't train, how the, were you so damn fast? I just like riding my bike. So, you know, for people out there, uh, are, what would you say to those thinking, Oh, I'm, I could get second. I don't need to train. I, now, I mean, racing has changed quite a bit. Mm. Now you have to train. I think there is a period of time uh, with the World Cup where I, I think you see this with riders like uh, Brendan Fairclaw, um, where for a long time they never trained, but they were fa fast as hell. But like, and also they, they're stylish. They have like a lot going for them and they're just naturally talented. But I think um, riders like Gwyn, who brought this motocross training aspect to mountain biking, um, kind of changed the sport. What exactly is the training? Is it going to the gym? Is it riding your indoor like stationary bike? Is it? I, is it riding your bike on trails? It's more or less like a lot of core, like kind of like just having a really strong foundational core. Um, Cause so like a lot of things are to just kind of like, you'd see people do these moves in the gym and you'd be like, that's kind of a weird move. But it's a very mountain bike specific move because it kind of like 
uh, strengthens like stabilizer muscles and stuff. Cause like the thing about like downhill is like, you don't necessarily have to be uh, aerobically fit. Like you have to be fit enough, but what you do have to be like fit is like be able to like withstand like, essentially you're just being punched for seven, maybe seven, not seven minutes, but like three minutes and still being able to pedal your guts out at the bottom. So, and also make decisions the whole way down. Um, so a lot of that is just like training to be calm in those situations. I see. But again, I, I, I'm not the best person to ask about like what to do for a training regimen. Cause like, I mean, like, I tried to train here and there, but I, I just found it absolutely boring. I just, like, so I'd rather just go ride my bike. So which of the three did you ax first? Um, so I stopped. So 2016 was my last year racing. Um, I still did collegiate because I got a scholarship to go to school for collegiate racing. So I still had to, like, finish out my collegiate career. Um, but 2016 was my last, like, real full... I don't even want to say it was full effort because like 2015, after I got that race result um, or qualifying result, my drive wasn't there anymore. So I went into 2016 and I just, I don't know, I just wasn't into it. Like I saw like I had some really good collegiate race results. Like I went against, uh, you know, Dakota Nor- uh, Norton was one of the kids in our collegiate division. Um, and like I went against him in like dual solemn after he had won crank works dual psalm that year and i took him out of uh whatever like dual psalm round we, we were, uh we were doing so it's like i still was competitive but i once i got into like the like actual race i wasn't willing to take the risks i knew i needed to take like i would get to a section where i knew i could do a gap that would be faster but i was like mm, not worth it so i uh, Racing came first. And then as I was going through school, I was kind of like learning stuff. I'm like, all the all this stuff we're learning in marketing is like outdated by like five, 10 years already. Like, so like the like finance stuff, like that's important. The, the accounting stuff, that's important. But um, I also found it extremely boring. So I, at, at that time I was like, I was going through school and I, like I was doing a, like a minor and kind of like video stuff. And like the teachers were like, they had no idea what they were doing. So I was like, the school aspect of uh, it was the second. And I, I never really, th- like, knew where YouTube was going to take me, but it just felt like the right direction to go. And when you took the dive, did you intend for it to be your job or uh, just a support to another job? Or- it was a slow burn. Because, like, luckily I had, like, you know, I was going to school, so I was, like, living in the dorms and whatnot. So I had a place to live. I didn't have to worry about rent and all that stuff because, like, student loans was paying for all of that stuff. But in the meantime, I was, like, trying to make videos. And so things just kind of worked out for the better. Um, and my wife had graduated before me at the time. So once, like, I was done with school, like, I had a place to live. Nice. Um, oh, yeah, hold on. We got a technical. What's going on? Some audio stopped recording on this, but we're gonna miss. Is it good? Is it still going? Is it, it still moving? Looks like it's moving on the road. Kaz, you're about to get Caster fired Pro. from DJ <laughs> producer <laughs> this role. This is not my job. Is it? Uh, is it still doing the recording thing on that on the computer? This is why we do two Hello? recordings. Yeah, at yeah once. we are recording on the oh, computer. Oh, beautiful! Oh, good well, let's job. Just pre- let's pretend that never happened. All right, yeah, I still have my job. <laughs> cut, 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 cut this out, Dave. Cut this out. <laughs> cut the commercial. Cut the commercial. Um, Phil. So hold on. Timeline here. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. When did you make How to Manual? That was 2015. 15. Okay, and then 2016. You're like no more racing. Don't yep. want to do that. Were you? still making videos after kind of how to manual like still yeah, monthly so, or um, couple months i put like monthly is kind of a i try i would try to like get on a schedule and i like, try to put out videos regularly but i put like so much effort into making my manual and bunny hop videos that i didn't know how to like a make those videos any quicker but add on to them because i put like so much time into making these videos as good as i could make them at the time now i could probably make them better but at the time it's like you know, uh, just like I was, I didn't know how to use a camera that well. So I was like, even like I'd go out, like take a shot and I'd come back and start editing. I'm like, wow, the lighting was awful. 
or something. And so I'd go back out with my camera and go do another spot, film it. And like kind of repeat that. So like my like editing process or filmmaking process was like slow. Cause I never like, I could never get things in one. Like I, I can't read from a script. I, I didn't have a lavalier at the time. So like the audio was always off to, so there's a lot of things that made my work process super slow. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Do you know, just trying to get a timeline of the thing. So you were like, 2016 comes around. Are you making videos on a, you're saying you're adhering to a schedule that just. I, like, I was, I was like, at, so actually 2016, I think is, or maybe it was 17. I started posting videos. I would actually try to do two a week for a bit. Cause I started doing like thrills with Phil to kind of play off skills with Phil. And those were like my first like uh, POV videos. Cause like we all wore this stupid gimbal and whatnot. So dangerous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the sternum breaker. Um, and uh, hey, who? Why are you calling my gimbal stupid, buddy? <laughs> and like, I I like those videos, but then you'd get people like bummed or pissed off at you that you were like showcasing their local trails, and okay. now yeah. so like then I had like some reservation about doing those videos. Um, <laughs> so I went back to just kind of doing like, hey, some tips and tricks to, or here's like seven skills like you can learn um but for a while like i was kind of like in this gray zone where i didn't have an identifying like video style right but you were still growing as a youtube channel you're still gaining subscribers yeah and you have a great name you know what you're signing up for skills with phil is like I there's no so. question you know exactly what you're gonna get i mean uh, do you feel well first of all who came up with the name me it was literally like i was making that tutorial i'm like i need a name for this tutorial on um, skills with Phil. So like, I think I had like a few, like kind of, but it was like, it happened in 10 minutes. And did you think that the, I mean, maybe even to this point has the name boxed you in? No. Cause like, oddly enough, like skills with Phil, like people try to box me in, but depending on how you interpret it, it's like, Hey, like I do have skills on a bike. So now you're just watching me ride. Mm -hmm. um, and technically it never says anything about mountain biking. So if I decide to go, do something completely different. It's broad enough where I could go do that because it's not skills with Phil mountain biking. It's skills with Phil. Okay. So what if uh, mountain bikes weren't in the picture? What's the next skill? Um, I'd say snowboarding, but I'm not very good at snowboarding. Okay, what about a non-sport skill? Uh, you got any artistic uh, or musical abilities that we don't know about? Any I, I mean, I, I'm a classically trained... Uh, um, I don't want to say chef, but classically Whoa. trained cook. Ooh. No Whoa. way. Okay. Hey, I will subscribe to your cooking channel in a heartbeat, Phil. What's your go-to dish? I'm like, Phil, cook me dinner. What are you going to make? Um, it depends on the time of the year, but I, I'm a big sucker for just keeping it simple. I, I love pizza, so. <laughs> <laughs> <But a> really <laughs> good pizza. Really good pizza. It's like you're but, making the dough and the sauce. So, and... like, uh, um, yeah, like my, my wife and I, who is now my – essentially my sous chef at this point. Um, but like, you know, if we don't have, you know, we're not above buying wraps, but like we try to make most of what we eat just cause it's more fun and cheaper. Um, and I, I don't know, something about the idea of like, Hey, I'm like the DIY. I made this. I like that. And so like everything I do, it's like, Hey, I make my videos myself. I edit my videos myself. I unfortunately cannot make a camera myself. But like, I, I but love... what if you could? Probably. Like, I, 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 I like knowing how to do things. And so if I had to do another... Cha um, like, if I were to do it again, it would kind of be like a smorgasbord of like, this is how you do things that you weren't taught how to do. Mm, smorgasbord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're... Okay, now we're fast forward to now. Like, for the audience at home, you're, you're a full-time YouTuber. That's your job. Yep. You have a half a million... Followers on YouTube, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a few people. It's it's definitely more than I ever thought I'd have. I think the uh, max, like, I, I was reading, we were reading f trivia facts about Whistler this morning, and it said that like on the busiest day, maybe not the busiest day of the year, but an average busy day in Whistler, it gets fifty thousand people. That's a so lot. So you have uh, quick mess. 10 times the amount of people in Whistler on a busy day the math watching checks out, the watching math checks your videos. Out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a lot of people. Yeah. And like, it used to be like nerve wracking, but now I've kind of come to like, it doesn't really phase me anymore. Like you kind of become numb to those numbers. 
Totally. You definitely Yeah, do. definitely. Yeah. Um, I and mean, even just saying that out loud now it, and struggling through the math, I'm like, wow, that's actually, that's a lot of whistlers. It seems kind of like, I, I know how I would feel like five years ago if I said that, but it doesn't seem as big now as it did before. Did you get excited on your first 1,000 views? Oh, or 1,000 subscribers? Yeah. Like, that that was, re- like, a hard grind to get. Um, and so the fact that, like, I got to, like, 100,000, which was a number I thought was astronomical, like, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, but, yeah, it's been kind of, like, an interesting kind of, like, seeing how YouTube comes in, uh, like, you change your, like, you don't have one content and stick to that the whole time. You change what you're doing Mm -hmm. depending on what the algorithm wants, what people want, or what you're into at that time. So uh, like during the pandemic, um, my wife and I, we bought a house. Um, We were planning on doing it, but the pandemic was like perfect timing. So we ended up starting doing some like building videos. And like, if you go back to some of my pre skills with Phil days, I had done some building on my channel. It was like pump track stuff. Um, and so it's kind of cool like to like, cause I love building just as much as I do writing. So I started doing some more, um, building stuff and those videos started to take off. But then I had like people on my channel, like being like, I subscribed for <laughs> POV videos. I'm like, mm-hmm. really depends on when you subscribe because like I started off like as like just doing, uh, like, uh, Highland didn't have any good GoPro runs. Like, so I started like doing good SEO and posting GoPro runs of Highland. Then I started doing the um, pump track trail stuff. And then I started doing the skills with Phil stuff. And then I started doing the PO, like the like gimbal POV. So like, depending on when you enter the channel, like you were like shown a different product. Um, so recently I've actually started doing more building stuff by I've isolated that to another channel. Okay. So you did, is it a second channel? Or is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's called Phil's World. And oddly enough, there's a mountain bike trail in Colorado named Phil's World. That was <laughs> totally coincidence. I, <laughs> But it works out for me. Um, but no, I like it was just kind of a throwaway name. And in that channel, I'm kind of putting all my building stuff over there. And it's a little bit more documentary, like less like artsy. Like when I got into YouTube, I really liked the artsy vibe that I got in creative vibe. But as I mature as a person, I find the stuff that I like to watch is like the really boring monotonous, like of someone fixing something and showing you how to do something. And like, that's well edited. Like if the lighting sucks and stuff, like, you know, I'm not going to watch it, but the guys who do it well, like I love watching a video of something I don't know how to do and coming out of that video and be like, Oh, I understand like how this thing works. Um, and so for me, that's very rewarding. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do over on my other channel. Have you ever watched videos of like people who get like old vices or something and they like restore a vice or like they peel all the rust off of like an old wrench or something like that? I've seen like, I don't, I don't know if I've seen a vice specifically, but I've definitely seen that kind of stuff. Is that what you're talking about? Like where people and you kind of like follow along the process and it's shot like, on a phone, essentially, probably. Yeah, like so, not that specifically, but I could, I could get down with that. Like, I, it's I love that good. stuff. It's real. Yeah, good. I've seen that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of reminds me of like power washing porn. <laughs> <laughs> sub, best subreddit in the world. Yeah. Well, well, like the like like they usually have like an interesting tool to like you know remove the totally. rust and like like I didn't know that tool existed, but I like found out about it through serendipity through watching a video about something I had no idea. I might need that tool down the line. And now I know it exists. So that's the kind of stuff that I really enjoy watching. What are the most popular videos on your channel? Well, or as far as tutorials go? Um, as far as tutorials go, I haven't checked in a while. Honestly, because I, I haven't done a tutorial in forever. Um, but I think it was probably my how to drop video. I think that one did pretty well. Um, oh, no, I know. Uh, I did a how to bunny hop and I just completely shot that on my iPhone. And... I'm super proud of that video. The production quality sucks. Um, I was, you know, there, there's a lot of like how I talked that didn't really do very well, but like the, the way I explained it, I go back to that. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm really happy with some of the things I identified in that video that I felt like no other bunny hop tutorial did. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's not like the most like flashy thumbnail, but I still think it's one of the best or better uh, bunny hop tutorials out there. You have some of the flashiest thumbnails on YouTube and they're just, you kiss. I just got to click them. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I'm uh, happy to hear that. You think so? Yeah. I mean, it's like, I feel like you were the person who really brought the arrow into the mm. game that I, I might take credit for that. Yeah. Like mm. you, and I regret it. You regret it. <laughs> well, You've created that? a monster. I, <laughs> what have I done? That's true. No, I mean, like you, you. I mean, thumbnails. First of all, are a two D image, and most of the time when you're seeing it, they're tiny. So you, the arrow brings this three uh, D element into the into the picture, and you know what you're trying to communicate with the arrows is which direction is the rider going? What are they jumping? Where are they landing? Because you know you can. You know, we all know about the GoPro effect and how, like, it's hard to show the steepness or the gnarliness of a, tr of a feature. Yeah. And I, I think the, the arrow just instantly it catches your eye. You're like, oh, I see what he's trying to do. He's trying to jump. He's trying to drop. He's, you know. I try to use those sparingly. Okay. Like, I, I, my thumbnail is I try to find a moment of the video that kind of represents it, mm. um, but also looks good on a small, damn it, uh, looks good on a small screen. And I try to like, I don't like taking third person shots and using a third person shot if it's going to be a GoPro video. Cause I want people to know what to expect when they're clicking the video. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> you I like, have some integrity there. Yeah, so like I always try to like use a moment from the video and then I'll doctor it up. But I try not to like do anything super deceiving. Like there's definitely some videos where like there is no good thumbnail. And so you have to do like, a lot more photoshopping than you'd like. How do you feel about like how much impact a thumbnail has on a video? Like even the fact that we're like talking about thumbnails now, cause like we used to make videos and like it just had the worst thumbnail mm. and like there was just less of it on YouTube and it wasn't saturated and it would do well. And, and now it's like, we're talking about thumbnails for like two hours a day when we're about to drop a video. It's like so many versions of it. It's, like, it's interesting because like it kind of separates the people who want to do it versus the people who actually like want to put into effort. But at the same time, like you can kind of get by on YouTube with just having great thumbnails and sh can I swear? Yeah. Shitty content. Fuck yeah. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> I blew it. My sound effect was better. You've played the applause like four times in a row. Oh, yeah. It's very... Figure out where the air horn um, is. But We're to gonna, well, he's going to exit on the air horn. But to your point, I think that's why TikTok does so well. Because you're not judging a video based on its thumbnail. You're not searching oh, for yeah. a video. You, yeah, you're just enough. fed a video mm. and you're right into the content. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons amongst many is that um, TikTok is so good. Like, it, like... You're right into the content, and if you like it, you scroll, or you if you like it, you watch it. If you don't like it, you scroll, and that's the metric. It's not about the likes to views. It's about that metric, and TikTok can kind of figure out, like, based on if someone's staying on a video, that's a good video. We'll serve that to more people. Well, the thumbnails are good for, you know, you need those for your su subscriber base, so you're trying to get them to, like, not just click once to keep clicking for yeah. <laughs> forever, but your videos inherently you already people they come to you because they already, they need something they need a tutorial they need to learn how to bunny hop so they're they come to you and then and then I guess they you know fall in love with your the way that you make your videos and then they subscribe. I, I think lately but, I've done more, like I haven't done tutorial in a while so it's more POV stuff. Okay, but I feel like like I was talking about with how like learning through observing. I feel like you can learn a lot by how to ride or. Uh, mountain bike culture through observing that I still think there's a lot of benefit to just watching people ride. Um, but I, I found like the thumbnails to like be definitely one of the trickiest parts of making a video. And like, it's cause like anyone can take a still shot from a video and it's just your handlebars and your hands, you, your face isn't in it. So how do you find a way to identify your videos or brand that image so it's yours mm -hmm. that's been the hardest because like everyone can go out and take this like same part of the like trail take a screenshot from that moment and have the same thumbnail they're all going to look the same so how do you make those images your own yeah how do you do it 
Yeah, please tell us. Yeah. That's my secret sauce. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> you make them yourself? Yeah. I spend a lot a lot of time in uh, Photoshop. Or yeah, we definitely reference your thumbnails a few times. Definitely screenshot and be like, yeah, look at this. Look at the way he does this. We're analyzing it. Yeah, we're just as analytic as you sometimes. But I'm, you're, you're great at observing, clearly. You, you, you have to be in order to do, to do well. And like I think anyone who is, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is like people on YouTube, um, don't put in work. There's a lot of stuff that goes in behind the scenes that like you, it, unless you do it for an extended period of time, it's one thing to do it for like a month. I'm like, Oh, my videos aren't doing well. Like you have to do it for like a year to understand like, or two years to understand how your energy levels kind of come and go the trends of like the seasonal, like what's doing well and what's not doing well. Um, so it's definitely, it takes a while to like be a real YouTube or I don't want to say real YouTuber, but to like understand what you need to do. Totally. I feel like it's a, it's an ongoing battle. I, I, I still don't feel like we know what we're doing I all the time. I don't think anyone ever does. I feel like you figure Mr. it out and then like it's, it just changes. Honestly, it's the it. ones that you try. The, for me, it feels like the ones yes. we hardly try. They do the best. Yeah. And it's like, well, well I can't, how do we how do we not try again? I don't know. I'm trying Sometimes to not try. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. So where are you at in your YouTube career at this point? Where am I at? I, I'm actually doing, I'm like, I felt like, through the pandemic, my channel has kind of been floating along, like, and I feel like this year's like starting in the fall was kind of a resurgence to like going back to like the videos that really like, that that people really liked. So I feel like right now, like my channel is on to up again, where we're starting to like go up another mountain. And so for me, um, I found that people really like just the POV stuff and. I've also liked the creative freedom of having another YouTube channel that can post stuff that's has a little bit less direction. Um, so I, I, I'm glad I made the decision to be a YouTuber, but it's hard for me to call myself a YouTuber cause it's comes with a lot of baggage these days. What would you call yourself? I don't know. That's the thing. It's like, I don't really consider myself a professional mountain biker anymore though. Like I still do. Like I, I, it depends on who I'm talking to, what my audience is. Okay. Like if it's a non-mountain biker, I'll say I was a professional racer or I am a pro professional mountain biker and I also make YouTube tutorials or something like that. If I'm talking to somebody who mountain bikes, I will usually just say I make YouTube videos and YouTube tutorials and I will kind of come at it more from a YouTube perspective. Um, and then there's some people that you get into the conversation and you're just like, I am a video producer. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I was yeah. wondering if you can, if you ever call yourself a filmmaker, but video producer, I guess, is one of the same. I feel like filmmaker does what you guys do like a disservice because like <laughs> I like I I understand the like I love watching films and like I you know I that's a whole nother conversation, but I realized I don't have the artistic eye or uh, drive to like want my videos to be artsy. But you, with I that said, you have an appreciate. Yeah, you appreciate, yeah. It and yeah. you, like, you know, exactly. you've spoken on lighting, and it's like you know that I, what looks terrible. I love Wes Anderson. I, I oh, okay. love yeah. Wes Anderson. I love Quentin Tarantino. Um, I appreciate really good art. I'm not capable of that. Neither are we. <laughs> <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, you, you got to bust a move here in yeah, two minutes. Yeah, I, I, I got a sprint. We learned that Phil is a very punctual man. Very punctual. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, this is our shortest pod yet, yet, but it was short and sweet. Sorry about that. That's okay. No, that's great. We're <laughs> glad to have you over here, you know? So good. Kaz I, is still surprised to see you. <laughs> you're still, you're here in Whistler? What'd you do with Andrew? He's in a box. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Is he in the refrigerator? Santos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what'd you do with Andrew? <laughs> no, he's behind the camera. <laughs> um, well, thanks for all that you do and your influence uh, goes far and wide and you've taught a lot of people out there how to do different things on your bike and you've gotten a lot more butts and saddles <laughs> and it's all about butts all about the butts yeah and you've inspired hundreds of thousands of people out there to either ride their bike or make youtube videos or just get out there so thanks well thank you on I, behalf of the people i think you guys uh do the same thing and thanks for shredding too you're a wicked rider and mm -hmm. uh you know Keep whatever you do it. you'll do a good job and you're uh you're it's 
intelligent guy. So we'll have to do this again. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Enjoy your sake margaritas. <laughs> All right, I think I got a sprint now. All okay. right, beat it. Beat it. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Feeding Off Each Other. Please subscribe for more great podcasts.